Uh, corruption and poor leadership, the only reasons why Africa is so poor. Why is the continent, which is the richest in terms of resources, the poorest in the world? The first answers that come to mind are, of course, corruption and poor leadership. However, we must never lose sight of our history. As such, I want to start trying to answer the question by looking at the history of how we got to where we are today. Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please sustain us by turning on your subscription and notification buttons. Thank you. As Franz Fanon puts it, colonization is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grips and emptying the native's brain of all form and content. By a kind of perverted logic, it turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. Like I said in some earlier episodes, as Africans and people of African descent in the diaspora, we cannot change our current circumstances if, one, we refuse to learn about our past. Two, if we do not strategize on how to change our present. And three, if we are not persistent about moving Africa forward. We owe our children, the next generation, a responsibility to ensure that they have as much right to actualize themselves as American, uh, European, Chinese children, and children born into other privileged parts of the world. Apologies to animal lovers out there. I have absolutely nothing against owning pets. But there is something seriously wrong with the world in which dogs and cats in some parts of the world with sparse natural resources are better fed than human children born in Africa with the richest natural resources in the same world. Africans and people of African descent cannot progress without using our history as armor a torch to light our paths to the, into the future. So let's start by recalling how in the 1400s, the Portuguese, who were the first European nation to start using African slave labor, developed sugar plantations in Sao Tome, just off the coast of West Africa. We must also never forget that since that time in the 15th century, and even after the abolition of a slave trade, Africa has continued to be the backbone that sustains the economies of the developed countries. Even till this day, and uh, the so-called uh, globalization, before we try to tackle the how, let us also be reminded that apart from the millions of people who were stolen and forced into slavery in the New World and Europe, millions of Africans had for many centuries also been sold and transported across the Sahara, the Indian Ocean, and the Red Sea by Arabs and others like them. So, how did, how has Africa sustained the economies of the developed world? Again, by examining our history, we will see that some of the countries in Africa from which the largest number of slaves were taken tend to be amongst the poorest today. <laughs> Someone once said, 
jokingly try to explain this saying, uh, this by saying that perhaps it is because the best of us were stolen or foolishly sold off by those of us who remained on the continent. Um, in other words, slavery was the original brain drain. On a really serious note, though, history also shows us how slave labor was used to build up the countries of the uh, uh, the countries that enslaved Africa and their economies. So, if we know these aspects of our history, we should therefore not be surprised that the current prime uh, minister of uh, Britain. Uh, Boris Johnson, even before he got to the post, where wrote without shame or apology defending Britain's enslavement and colonization of Africans and Africa by claiming that it was all done from uh, to, by claiming that it was all done to protect Africa from the Arabs. And I'm going to uh, take a quote from. Um, the, an article which he published in 2016 in The Spectator titled Africa is a mess but we can't blame colonialism so here is a quote from that article are we guilty of slavery? it was one of the first duties of Frederick Lugard who colonized Buganda in, uh, in the 1890s to take on and defeat the Arab slaves. End of quote. And in case you still think that he is in any way apologetic for the way Britain has continued to exploit um, African countries, this is another quote from the same article. The continent may be a blot, but it is not a blot upon our conscience. Uh, now, this is the man that the majority of uh, the British people have chosen to be their prime minister. So how else can we then interpret the election of Boris Johnson, uh, of Boris Johnson by a majority of the British people, if not as a sign that the majority who voted him in believe that empire was a noble cause or they see nothing wrong uh, with the role that their country played in the raping and pillaging of africa and they and that they approve of the warped global economic architecture um, of which their country is a um, is a major uh, player it will, of course, be a mistake to think that it is only the British that think that way. What kind of um, sentiment do you think got Donald Trump into power in the U.S.? Yet, Africans still delude ourselves into thinking that the, way, uh, that the ploy to continue to exploit us called globalization can ever favor us. We need to think again. We must never stop reminding ourselves that slave trade and colonization almost totally decimated and continues even after the official um, end of uh, colonization to taunt us by glossing over our history finding innovative ways to uh, justify colonization and entrench new colonization and the, also the blatant refusal to make reparations. Let us now look at some of the duplicitous ways in which the developed countries have continued to impoverish Africa. First, when African countries were granted independence, the European, colonizers, uh, the European colonizers made sure that they set them up to fail. At independence, the greatest challenge 
that most African countries faced was how to move from uh, the agrarian economies, which they had been forced to remain, to an industrial economy within the shortest uh, possible time. This was in a bid to catch up with the developed world. However, the first crop of African leaders, even good intentioned and committed uh, Pan-Africanists like uh, Walimu Nyereri in, uh, in Tanzania and uh, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana found themselves left in the unenviable situation of inheriting nation states that had been cobbled together based on faulty European uh, prototypes. 